Good morning. This is Assemblywoman Kadi Petrie Norris. Thanks so much for joining us for today's town hall conversation. Uh, today we are talking about combating homelessness in the midst of a global pandemic. On any given night here in Orange County, almost 7,000 men, women, and children find themselves without a place to sleep. These are our neighbors. These are members of our community and it is shameful and unacceptable. The good news is that Orange County has, for the course of the last several years, made really tremendous progress in addressing our homeless crisis with new shelters coming online, new permanent supportive housing uh, complexes opening their doors and welcoming people home each and every day, and a system of care being built out across the county. Today, I'm really pleased to be able to welcome three guests who are leading the charge in the fight to end homelessness here in Orange County and who have developed innovative and creative solutions to meet this challenge, to meet this moment in the midst of the COVID-19 pandemic. So pleased to welcome Sue Parts, who is the President and CEO of the United Way, Timothy Wynn, who is the Chief Program Officer at Mercy House, and Dawn Price, the Executive Director from the Friendship Shelter. Thank you all for being here, and I am so excited to, to get an update on all of the, the work that, uh, that, that you and your teams have been doing over the last several months, and also to be able to answer some of our, our questions from folks at home about how they can, how they can get involved, how they can support you um, as we move through this pandemic together. Um, so just to, to kick us off, if you all can introduce yourself, tell us a little bit about your organizations. Sue, we'll start with you. Okay, well, Assemblywoman, thank you so much for having me have the opportunity to share some thoughts this morning. It's always good to see you. Um, so I am the CEO of Orange County United Way. I've been in this role around three years. And a little over, I would say, two and a half years ago, we were really looking at what we could do around homelessness and how we could help close gaps and maybe work to bring everybody um, in a more collaborative way to solving solutions. And so um, we were able to pull together an initiative called United 10 Homelessness. And I'm happy to say that, that Dawn and Timothy's organizations are both active members of, of that as we work together to end homelessness. In addition to that, the United Way is really focused on economic security. So what's going on through the pandemic and families is really um, important to us because we don't want anybody else to fall into homelessness, as well as what we're doing to ensure students are graduating, not only academically, but um, mentally and physically and just life ready in this really challenging time. So those are the three big initiatives. And again, glad to be here. Well, and thank you, Sue. And I, I really do feel like the the creation of United to End Homelessness was felt like a real turning point for the county. It's just this powerful collaboration from our, our business leaders, philanthropic leaders, leaders in the faith community, and community members to make a commitment to, to end homelessness in our county and to implement strategies that do that in a real and meaningful way. Um, so excited to, to have you here. And Timothy Wynn, thank you so much for being here as well. Oh, Assembly Women, thank you again for the invitation to be part of this uh, conversation. Um, I'm Timothy Wynn, I'm the Chief Program Officer uh, here at Mercy House. And I kind of, to do kind of a quick summary of, of Mercy House, uh, our, our goal, our, our mission here is really to create a, a system of of services and uh, and care uh, that creates a flow of f out of homelessness in, into housing. Uh, we we really we do believe that uh, homelessness is is not something that should be managed, uh, but rather uh, an issue that, that we have uh, the capacity uh, to actually to solve. Uh, we want to create those solutions uh, to homelessness and to move people from uh, from the streets into uh, permanent permanent housing. Well, and I love I, I love. Um, what you said about the fact that we've got to believe that there is a solution. I think it's easy for, um, you know, frankly, ordinary citizens and also policymakers to sometimes just feel overwhelmed and just go, you know, God, it, it seems impossible. Um, and so I love the focus of all three of you, both your belief that, that we can solve this and breaking it down into initiatives and projects that actually are going to solve it. Uh, Dawn, thank you for being here. 
Well, and thanks as well for the invitation and to sit alongside these two really wonderful um, leaders in our community. Uh, I'm with Friendship Shelter. I'm um, finishing my 12th year as Executive Director of Friendship Shelter. And our mission is to focus on the south part of Orange County, um, the South Service Provision Area, and our goal is to end homelessness in the South Spa. Our numbers here are the lowest. We're the, um, we're the area that has the fewest uh, people in the point in time count. And so everything that my colleagues here have talked about is so very actionable here in South Orange County. So the goal is uh, we know people will um, still have moments in their life of struggle and poverty, but we want those periods of homelessness to be very brief, less than 30 days, uh, one time in their life and never again, and permanently ended through housing. And so that, that's our goal through our shelter programs and our larger program is our housing program, our permanent supportive housing program. Well, I know sometimes when people think of South Orange County, they think of the, you know, sort of NIMBY, not in my backyard, you know, or we don't have a problem. And I think you and Friendship Shelter have played just a, a phenomenal role, I think, in changing that conversation um, and in bringing the community together in earnest uh, to be part of this solution. Now, I want to I want to start um, by turning our focus to the the COVID nineteen pandemic. Um, you know, this is as, as we've often said, it's an unprecedented crisis and um, has has introduced particularly pronounced challenges for our most vulnerable communities, especially for our our homeless uh, our homeless communities. And um, so uh, to start, I would love just to, if you could t walk us through you know, some of the first actions that your organizations took um, at the onset of the COVID-19 uh, the COVID-19 pandemic and some of the work that, that you've been doing as part of the response. Um, Timothy, let me, let's start with you. So was it back in March when, uh, yeah. when all this kind of began? Um, we started to hear people throw the word pandemic around and sort of really take that seriously. So one of the first things we did um, was we, uh, we assigned our, our shelter administrator, um, one of our staff members kind of as a point person to, to gather information because we didn't know what we were dealing with at that time, but we knew it was gonna be important. And so we, we wanted to get a hold of what the, the guidance was from experts because we're not, we're not doctors, um, but we wanted to see what were the doctors saying uh, and what uh, what precautions do we need to take in order to uh, really prevent something terrible happening in our programs? Right, because we operate uh, congregate shelters with you know some over a hundred people staying in the same place, and uh, just the thought of an outbreak in one of those places, um, you know, we wanted to do our due diligence to be sure that uh, we were following uh, the guidelines in order to make it as safe as possible. Um, and so very early on, we kind of established practices for, for hand washing and social distancing. And then as guidelines around masking came out, um, you know, we, we implemented those programs, or those policies in our programs that all of our staff are required to wear masks. And we got masks to, uh, to provide to our shelter residents and, um, and in order to be as, as safe as possible. Um, in our other programs, in our um, our housing solutions programs, where we do, you know, case management and maybe permanent supportive housing, uh, we looked at uh, what it might look like for our, our, our staff to have masks, or maybe you know, we don't enter our homes as much as we do before, or um, you know, we work to see what uh, what kind of remote options were were feasible and reasonable, right? Because the the work that we do. Um, we can't do it all remotely. We have to be, there's something about contact uh, with, a, with a person that, that really maintains their, their stability, maintains their connection to, to the services that we do. But, uh, so we had, to, we had to make that um, determination on what, what level of contact were, were we willing to, uh, to do um, and what, what were some, uh, some cases where we could do maybe remote contact instead. And really that is determined on a case by case uh, basis based on uh, each individual person's, each case's needs and their, their individual acuity. Um, as situations developed and, and more resources became available, um, you know, we, we, we continue to work with our partners. We partner pretty closely with, uh, with uh, HCA um, and the, the public health doctors and nurses. And they, they've given us a lot of guidance on, uh, on our best practices and how and how we want to maintain distancing in our in our shelter spaces, um, we've reduced our capacity in some of our shelters in order to uh, be able to 
maintain safer distances. And, um, you know, even though we are in, in the midst of a pandemic, we still actually opened up uh, some shelters. Uh, we opened up the Buena Park Navigation Center earlier this year. Um, and we did, you know, we did that with, uh, with input from the healthcare agency um, and the public health doctors and, um, you know, in order to do that as, as safely as possible. Uh, when, you know, unfortunately we do have to limit our, our capacity. Um, we had designs that we made before uh, a global pandemic arrived. And, uh, you know, we have, to, we have to be agile in order to, um, in order to uh, mm -hmm. accommodate the, you know, this new normal moving forward. Right. This new, this, this new for now, new for yeah. now normal. For now. Um, but yeah, it's certainly, uh, it's, it has turned the entire world on its access and uh, is, it's changed reality for, for so many of us. Um, John, tell us a little bit about, uh, about what Friendship, Friendship Shelter did uh, in response. Well, we did many of the same things um, Timothy and Mercy House did, and that's not um, surprising because we were on the phone with each other all the time, our staffs um, sharing documents back and forth. Here's how we're communicating. What are you doing about this? What are you doing about that? And one of the great things about our shelter provider community is we do share so freely and really learn from each other. So we were, um, when, 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 uh, situations would come up, we had good partners to, to talk about. Some specific things about our, we're the primary shelter provider in South Orange County, and um, both of our shelters are in the city of Laguna Beach. So we had great partners at the city um, that really stepped up and helped us uh, create the safest environment we could. Like Timothy said, one of our shelters, on the one that's on um, Laguna Canyon Road is a congregate shelter, it's one big room. And that building is used, was used, for an overnight program that ended mid-morning and then cleared out so that we could have a day center there for people who did not yet have a shelter bed. We had to close that day program because it was important that those overnight folks could shelter in place 24 seven. And so that was a big change that we had to make um, when we were grateful and um, probably talk later about Project Roomkey because that made it possible for us to do that knowing that those unsheltered people would have an, have a, um, an opportunity. You know, we we made the decision to go shelter in place mode about two days before the state order came out, the safer at home order came out. So we were a, a, just a couple days ahead. But what strikes me thinking back to that time was that the governor's order came out on the 19th, I believe it was, and all of our shelter workers, we needed to expect them to show up on the 20th and leave their homes and come to congregate shelters and provide the care and services to keep our clients safe. And so they became very, very essential workers. And it was just extremely heartwarming to me to see that everybody just um, showed up and did their work and uh, responded to all the new protocols. And there was a you know, there was a period, I don't know about you, Timothy, but there's a period with us where there was a new protocol every day. Oh, we're going to do it this way now. Oh, wait, we're going to do it this way now. And they were just rolling with it. And honestly, I work in our administrative offices and my program director said, you should go out to the shelters. It will make you feel better. And it was so tense here because it was so new. Mm -hmm. And I went out to the shelters and it was pretty much business as usual in terms of the attitudes and the, um, the, the per sense of purpose. And so I'm really proud that all of our shelter workers across Orange County continued to do this important work. Um, in our housing program, it pretty much the, mirrors what Timothy's already said. The one thing that is maybe a little bit different for us in South County, both in shelter and housing, has been how we provide food. Um, we provide food in our shelters by volunteers. And um, that has typically been, in each shelter, kind of a nightly potluck where a church group or a um, school club or something, a book club will come in and have prepared food and set it all out and everybody goes through like a good old fashioned potluck and everybody touches every spoon as they serve themselves. Well, all of that um, became, you know, uh, obviously not safe and probably taught us lessons that will carry through much after the pandemic, that that was probably never a good, good way to provide dinner. And so all of our meal um, volunteers, we were very worried we would have huge costs, huge meal costs. And instead, for the most part, our meal 
volunteers have continued to bring meals in new ways. They, if they do it like um, Postmates does it now, they just bring it and drop it and someone comes out and gets it and then we plate it up, our staff plates it up inside so that people, we don't have everybody touching the serv serving utensils. So that was a big change for us in both shelter programs because we do rely on those volunteers. Um, in the housing programs, the way South Orange County is laid out, for someone, often for our folks in housing to get to a grocery store, it means a bus ride and a trip to the grocery store. So that's like a double risk, right? And so we've been doing a lot of um, dropping boxes of food, going to book, um, going to food, banks on behalf of our clients and then dropping boxes for them um, so that they're not having to take those risks. And um, so that's been one big change for us. I think the organizational aha is something we already knew, which is that housing and health are completely intertwined and that the people in our housing have needed far less additional support and change, changed ways mm -hmm. of doing things than the people in our shelters. And Sue, tell us a little bit about the, the journey the United Way's been on over the last uh, the last several months. Yeah, well, thank you. And again, I'm always in awe of my partners in here and everything that you're doing to keep people so safe. So when we um, learned that this was really um, going to be a big impact, you know, we had that sense. Um, one of the first things we did was say, we need to rally the community to see what they can do to help. So we did start a pandemic relief fund and we kicked that off the if the governor's announcement was thursday it was on friday that we kind of formed it and with two main goals one was that we were concerned about more people falling into homelessness and if there's anything that we can do to help people while they were waiting for additional um, support whether from their company or government or whatever was going to happen that gives some people some um, immediate cash that they could use to help pay their rent or food or whatever basic needs that they had so we really quickly, um, and I think the word that we all love, I, I love the agile Timothy used, but pivot, we pivoted. And we um, you know, created a, a program, Amazon Web Services uh, partnered with us and we created an app that we work with a number of service providers, I think it's 48, to for them if they were case managing somebody who they just had gotten housed, so they didn't fall back into homelessness, how we got them $500 in assistance. And, even this morning, I was reading a story about, and this is an um, anonymous name, but Franny and her three children that had just got housed and was a domestic violence victim. I thought everything was going her way, right? And all of a sudden, this hit, her hours were cut, and the service provider let us know through the case manager and we, through the, the short but painless verification done, we were able to get her the $500 that allowed her to make the make those additional uh, necessities covered so she could use what money she had towards the rent. So heartfelt stories and the community um, assemblywoman was just magnificent in their support and coming through from $5 to 500,000. It was amazing. And so we've used monies to go to, out to individuals. We've helped now close to 5,000 households um, in the next week or so we'll cross 5,000. Um, we'd love to do more um, just because the need has not gone away. And then we also separated funds to say, what are the system needs? And so we've um, worked with the shelters to whether it's additional mass. I know there's been food. Um, we, I know I talked to Dawn and said, you know, is there anything we could do for some of the frontline workers who are going above and beyond? So we did a little extra something for, you know, front line workers where possible to help them get through. And then what our own program, Welcome Home OC, which is where we um, had to pivot again because this is the landlord assistance program and all of a sudden HUD wasn't doing the inspections in the same time because of again all of the concerns so it took a it we had to slow down for a couple of months while we learned all the new systems of how you inspect the departments and all of that and then obviously when it kept going so people um, learned how to do it virtually and doing inspections in different ways. So we were able to start getting people housed again in scattered sites around the county. So the fund, um, the fund being two ways, the individuals and the systems, like the shelter system, the food system, how we could support that. And then our own programs, Welcome Home OC, um, we pivoted on that. And I just end with saying, 
the volunteers. We have so many wonderful volunteers that want to know how they can help. And so some will do remote, some will do, you know, virtual, and some will do what Dawn said, go drop off food or go, you know, take the extra step ahead. So kind of rallying volunteers to help too. Yeah. And I do feel, um, you know, clearly a, a crisis, sometimes it brings out the worst in people, but oftentimes it really does bring out the best in people. And I feel like there are just everyday heroes all throughout our communities who are, are doing everything that they can to help our neighbors, to help our communities uh, survive this uh, this crisis. And I see my my dog is making a making a guest appearance. That's all right. It's the our new Zoom our new Zoom reality. Now, John, I wanted to pick up on um, on something that you mentioned. So so John, you you mentioned Project Room Key. Um, so you know, I think right away, California, you know, both locally and all across the state, we recognize that um, when we understood that we were confronting this pandemic on, you know, on our shores, that the uh, you know, individuals experiencing homelessness presented a unique risk and it was a place where this really could spread like wildfire. Uh, and so uh, across the state, we, we stood up a program called Project Room Key in order to ensure that uh, individuals who are experiencing homelessness had a safe place to shelter in place um, and to recover and to receive care if they were either COVID positive or if uh, they were in a, in a high risk group. Um, John, anything else I'd love to just hear about your experience with Project Room Key, you know, on the ground in practical terms and how that, how that has rolled out across the county? Well, it's, it was a heavy lift. I mean, it was really yeah. difficult to find the source um, places, uh, hotels, primarily motels, to, uh, to, to stand up those pro programs and then staff and all of that, and Illumination Foundation staffed those programs. Um, for the shelter provider, and, and I know Timothy does outreach as well, we do a little bit of outreach in, in um, Laguna Beach, uh, to be able to have a place that to, to send someone quickly uh, and, and get them safe, and really in three areas. Um, first and foremost, if you're a shelter provider and someone is experiencing symptoms, um, someone is coughing, has a fever, and you're standing there with 45 people you're responsible for and this one person and your staff, the ability to isolate that person quickly um, is limited in most of our uh, our shelters that we can't really isolate someone for very long because of bathroom uses and all of those things. So to be able to get someone very quickly to an isolation bed where not only are they out of that group at the shelter, but they're in a more comfortable, comforting place when they're in a very scary time of their life when they're sick. And so we've been very impressed that those um, placements are made quickly. Someone comes to our shelter and picks up the ill individual and takes them to the project room key site. Secondly, then we have some people in our shelters. We have an older um, uh, chronically homeless population in South County in particular. So we have people as old as in their 80s. And to be able to take people with chronic health conditions who are um, elderly out of the congregate shelter uh, situation and place them into these temporary uh, safer uh, motel room situations is really critical. And then the third population that Room Key is also hitting is the unsheltered population. And the ability, and this is both for the community's feeling of, of health and safety as well as the individuals, to be able to walk up to somebody who's living unsheltered and say, uh, we can make you safer, we can take you to an, another location and provide you with that safety. And so in South County, they really hit all three of those populations. And I think that's true, Tim, Timothy, and um, throughout the rest of the county. Um, so then today, we're transitioning to Project Tool Belt, which is the sort of the next generation program. Um, and uh, we're leading that with Mercy House as a subcontractor here in South County. And we've already been able to relocate all of those general unsheltered folks who were in that, um, the facility for that group. Our team has already found alternative placements for all of those folks, including some that we were able to house directly out of 
um, that site and then some that we were able to reunite with family from those sites. So um, now we're working on the second site here in South County, which is for the sick and um, vulnerable and working in, to do those same things to take that next step. And the county has been a great partner. It's kind of what, whatever it takes. Our organization is very much whatever it takes. And it's great to work with a government partner that's saying the same things. Let's just do whatever it takes to yeah. get this right. Yeah. And uh, I'm so pleased that we have our our closest collaborator mercy house is our partner in this well and i you know as as, as all of you were talking um you know i was i'm struck by the fact that six months ago the risks associated with our homeless response were profound and you know there has been so much devastation and heartbreak for all of us over the last six months but our homeless response has actually been a bright spot and a, and a success story. We have not seen yes. the, you know, wildfire outbreaks. We haven't seen the, the rampant no. devastation that you know, frankly, I think we would have had, had, had we, and, and had all of you not acted as, as swiftly, as decisively and as effectively as possible. Um, so I think that that's, that is like that in a, in the very dark cloud uh, that we're living yeah. through. Um, has been has been a bright spot. Um, uh, Tim, Tim or, or Sue, anything you'd add around Project Room Key or Project Tool Belt? I mean, if I were to say anything, I would echo what Don said about how like vitally important Room Key has been. Um, just if you have a congregate shelter in order, we have kind of some spaces which we could use for isolation, but those spaces are imperfect. There's still an overlap um, with the sort of general population there. It, to be able to take somebody who's uh, showing symptoms and, 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 and temporarily house them at another site, um, I think has been just crucially crucial to the, the safety of our shelters and our safe operations. And uh, so, so you, you had picked up on what I think is such an important point that um, this pandemic, it hasn't just presented us with this immediate and you know, unprecedented public health crisis. We're also in a pandemic induced recession. We are experiencing record rates of unemployment across California. We've had more than 8 million, 8 million Californians who have filed for unemployment. And while we know that our, our safer at home orders certainly has saved lives, it's also been devastating for so many families and workers and you know, our small business owners across across the county. Um, you, you talked about the fact that like pre preventing someone from going into homelessness is, is always a lot better than the work that needs to be done to, to find someone a home once they've lost it. Um, but just can you help like folks at home, folks listening from home, just understand the scale of I guess the increased need that we are seeing. So, um, you know, over the last six months, how has the reality shifted for, for people that are kind of struggling to hang on? Yeah, so um, we um, started a call with the food banks. You know, we have two food banks that serve Orange County um, every week and um, also had 211, so the call center for social services need for the county. And immediately the calls to 211 like doubled overnight. And the two big things are rent and food, right? And again, two just essential basics of life. It's hard. And we always think it's so hard for a family who's not sure if they could put food on the table or pay their rent to help homeschool their child, right? You know, all of this is so integrated and in everything going on. Um, so I would say those still needs are still so strong. And so I'll get an update this coming Monday, but I would just say for the time of year, the needs have doubled over the, what they were ever before. And so we're trying to see how we can help if there's additional things we can help with the food system while we're looking at other uh, ways. And I know that there's rental assistance started by some cities and other things going on. And we just love everything that can do to help people you know, stay where, stay where they are. And our fund continues as well, if, you know, for support. But um, I do think uh, it's going to be a long road. And we've heard anywhere from, you know, there could be uh, Donna or Timothy, my note, up to 
20% more um, folks that fall into homelessness and I've heard all the way up to 40. And again, the point in time yeah. count will be done again in January and we'll get the results in April, but um, everything we can do as a community to help people who need help now and keep them in place will serve us all in the long run. Absolutely, everything I think that we can do to, to stabilize to stabilize people, to stabilize families, and stabilize our communities while we navigate this crisis. Because, like you said, it's um, you know we've got a long road ahead of us. It is incredibly, it is incredibly daunting. The challenges that we're all facing are um, immense. I, I guess you know when when life gives you lemons, we all try to make lemonade. Are there any kind of you know has, have there been any silver linings? Are there any like okay, I'm glad that I'm glad that now we've got this. Any. Timothy, I'll start with you. Yeah, I think um, that that question brings me back to like early March when this everything was starting, and uh, our, our I think our initial reaction was one of fear. We were really scared, and we were worried that uh, that things were going to really go sideways. Um, and then, so I was I was on a call with uh, one of my shelter managers, um, and uh, you know, as Don kind of touched on earlier, for them they were on the front lines and more or less things were continuing uh, almost almost like normal. And uh, uh, my shoulder manager was asking me for, for you know, uh, can we have a, you know, can we do a little, they needed some extra expense to, I think it was to pay for a, um, uh, an application fee, for a rental application fee. Um, and it was, it was in that moment and like, while I was worried about a pandemic spreading, I realized that we were still, we're still doing the good work of housing people. Um, and e even though we're in, in this pandemic, we're the, I think maybe the, the best way to get people out of, in, into a safest environment is really to get them out of the shelter into a home. Um, and it, I don't know, that, that's given me kind of a motivation to, to, you know, to really look at our system and say, what can we do now when we need it most to make the most flow out of our shelters and into, um, into, into housing? And it also kind of inspired me a little bit to think, well, we're still doing this good work. Just because uh, we have, you know, this new, uh, new thing to, to worry about, that doesn't mean that uh, all our other work hasn't stopped. We're still uh, moving, pushing forward and, and, you know, bringing people from homelessness into, into housing. And John, any bright spots for, yeah. for you? Well, I would just echo that, that, you know, we just got our uh, first six month uh, data in and it, it, we're on track to hit the same housing numbers we hit last year, despite the pandemic. And that means, and for us, that that's a person by person, that's not opening a big building and all of a sudden, you know, you, you add 20, 30 people to your housing numbers. No, this, this, is, this is the one by one work of what is your housing plan? Do you have income? How can we increase your income? Let's apply for vouchers and other types of housing, maybe a room for rent. Let's go see eight rooms for rent and hope one of them works out. Let's find your deposit, let's move you in. All of those steps, doing that in a pandemic is, um, is really remarkable. And for us to be on pace to hit the same numbers we hit last year is just remarkable to me and a real testament to the work that we do and the importance of keeping it going. I do think we're one silver lining is the sense of urgency on the part of our clients as they see themselves in the middle of a public health emergency and the opportunity to work with unsheltered people who were placed in temporary shelter through Project Roomkey, the opportunity to work with those folks who have had a breather from life on the street and maybe have new, um, new insight into what is possible. And there's a lot of talk about how there are homeless people who want to be homeless. I don't believe that. I think they've lost hope. And I think those brief stays in those temporary shelters really provided that hope and that opportunity that I can live a better life. And, and so we're trying to seize those opportunities right now. And I think when, um, when people feel seen, when they feel like, you know, some people recognize our shared humanity, like that, that can be transformative. Um, and I think for me, a bright spot kind of in this, in this arena has been um, the, the establishment of, of Project Home Key. And uh, so what the state has done is, is made uh, dollars available to, um, to counties to, uh, for, 
for motel conversion projects. And that was kind of a transition from, from Project Room Key, which I'm not sure would have happened or gotten momentum kind of without, without that. And uh, as I know all of you know, but, but um, our audience may not, Orange County has worked with our, our local governments and um, you know, local, uh, local leaders to identify potential projects in the county. And I, I believe it's uh, three potential sites that have been identified and they've submitted applications. And they were, um, you know, Orange County was actually, I think they submitted the very first application for funding. Um, and uh, we're waiting to hear back on that. But, uh, but I think that, that that, again, it's a testament to, um, I think, the commitment of, uh, of, of the county and the effectiveness of the collaboration that you all have been so vital in. Um, now, I, I'd like to, to just talk a little bit um, beyond just the, the focus on, on pandemic response. I'd like to highlight a, a couple of initiatives I know that you're all working on and then hear about anything else that, uh, that, that you, you want to highlight for folks at home. So, Sue, you mentioned Welcome Home OC. Um, can you just tell us a little bit more about that program and, and what's, what's the latest? Yeah, thank you. And I feel it dovetails again nicely of what we were just saying because that program continued, right? And that's mm -hmm. a program where um, we um, incent landlords to help us and homelessness. And so in scattered sites around the county, um, we now have, I believe, 57 apartment owners who are part of this network. If anyone's listening and has apartments or even one condo, um, please let us know, unitedwayoc.org. We'd love for you to be part of that network. But in total, we've um, housed now 213 people in scattered sites. So their homelessness has ended. And Kati, you were so magnificent in helping us secure the 2.9 million to help end veterans homelessness as part of the county's marching home program. And as of today, I was adding up the numbers. It looks like 47 um, vets have had their homelessness ha ended wow. because of that funding. And I know there's projects that have been built. So collectively, you know, we are moving forward to uh, end veterans homelessness here together. So thank you for that. But so Welcome Home is a program just to, again, get the first and last month rent, the um, furniture, all of those things in place that make somebody, um, you know, that has a housing voucher, mm -hmm. that rent is secure and guaranteed by the government, by HUD, get them a place to call home, which again, keeps them safe and healthy because as Don said, health and home are, are you know, go together hand in hand. So mm -hmm. anyway, so it's good. It's good, uh, Kati. Um, more apartments, more support, everything, but ending homelessness is key. That's, Thank that is, that's great. I'm, I'm excited to, I'm excited to hear that. I'm so excited to hear that, you know, you've been able to make that progress in the midst of all the other challenges we're facing I think, you know, when I first heard about the Welcome Home OC program, it just, it felt like such the missing piece because, you know, we leave, we leave millions and millions and millions of dollars on the table every year, like federal dollars on the table in these unused housing vouchers and your ability to, to match people with housing voucher, vouchers with private market landlords and create kind of this trusted intermediary. It's just, I think it's so, it's so smart and it's like, you know, it's not having to build everything. It's like connecting the dots, putting the pieces of the puzzle together um, in such a powerful way. And uh, so Timothy, um, tell us about your Mercy House's street outreach services. So our we have street outreach services right now in uh, in South or in the Southern Spa. Um, in, and we have contracts with the county and with several of the cities down there. Um, and our folks are uh, out there on the streets engaging with uh, with uh, the street homeless. Um, and Kind of early on, again back back at the beginning of this, the of in March we we were out there and uh, before there was Project Room Key, we, you know we kind of recognized the need to provide a safer location. So we were using what resources we had and what what you know partnerships we had with kind of like a scattered uh, sites of, of hotels to try to put people into hotels to get them um, somewhere safe so they could they could they could isolate um, for the time being. Um, and I think that's, that was kind of the beginning of being able to refer people into, um, into our services, in, into like the system of care. Uh, I think Don touched on it earlier. She said that uh, one of the silver linings from this is now we have an opportunity to uh, engage with folks who maybe were more resistant before. And I think um, 
given the urgency of, of COVID-19, we were able to uh, engage with, with people who were, uh, you know, weren't willing to come into a shelter before. Now that, you know, they come into a hotel and now, they've, now they're engaged in Project Room Key. Um, and now they're in, maybe engaged in Project um, Tool Belt and we're working with them uh, to create a housing plan, really to get them, uh, move them forward towards a, a solution to their homelessness. Well, and John, uh, Friendship Shelter uh, also runs the alternative sleeping location in Laguna Beach. And I know that there's been a lot of work underway to, uh, to en enhance the offerings at that facility to, to um, be able to provide a, a deeper level of service. Can you give us an update on, on that work? So we, the day program I mentioned earlier, which we've unfortunately had to um, suspend during COVID was part of that. But another big piece that's coming very soon is, um, is a complete renovation of that um, temporary building. It was never intended to be um, used 24 seven as, you know, as, as uh, robustly, I guess I'll say, as we use it. And so we'll be going under construction this fall. And it's another example of great public-private partnership. The city applied for those funds, which were state funds that came to um, for that project. And we ran into, uh, because of COVID, we ran into a stumbling block a couple of weeks ago um, because we thought we could maybe re relocate that program to a church or something during the renovation, but that's not something any church wants to take on right now is having the increased risk in their facility. And so the county came through with a second temporary building that's going to go up next to where we are and allowing us to completely relocate right next door on site really um, while that, those important renovations are going on. And I'm just, for everyone to, go ahead with that project in that way at this time, I think is just a, a, another bright spot that we're just, I think we're getting to a point in this pandemic where we're saying, well, you know, it might be different, but we have to move forward with this stuff. We have to keep doing our, what we planned. And um, just like I was at my niece's wedding a couple of weeks ago, that's why I flew and there were only 14 of us and they went ahead and they did what they had to do in a safe way. And I think that's the same thing we're doing in homelessness is we're we're going ahead and we're doing what we have to do um, in new ways and in creative ways. So we're very excited for those changes. And speaking of speaking of new and creative, Sue, tell us about uh, your new nailing it for healthcare workers program. Oh wow! Well, this is exciting for us. Our vice chair of our board of United Way is Tam Wynn, and Tam and his family own Advanced Beauty College. And immediately, obviously, the nail salons um, were hit immediately in terms of having to close. But what was so fantastic is Tam and some other leaders in that community got together and said, we have hand sanitizers, we have masks, we have all these things that people need right now. And within the first 10 days, they had distributed 120,000 face masks to frontline workers. This is in the first 10 days, even though their own businesses were suffering, they all came together to do that. And 300,000 gloves. And it's just been wonderful to see the community come together. They're out delivering food from restaurants that are volunteering. So when we heard about all this, we um, gave them some financial support. We also, whatever we can do to have them be our partner when distributed. So one day we were reading the emergency announcements and the county needed 30,000 masks for the, tw um, for the home care health care workers, the folks that maybe they're living with a disabled, um, you know, relative or there's somebody looking in on somebody and they needed more masks and the masks were short. So we went to our friends at Nailing It. They secured for us 30,000 beautifully handmade uh, face masks. Wow. Love it. We distribute it. So um, great, great folks, passionate about the community and helping. So we're happy to part with nailing it. That is great. And so if, if there's a, there's other people at home who are listening and saying, you know, gosh, I want to be part of this work. I want to be part of the solution. How can they get involved? How can they help you right now? Uh, Timothy, I'm going to start with you. Well, I mean, I think the, the first thing that comes to mind, um, and, and Sue kind of touched on it, is as this continues, we, we, we are all in need of more PPE items. And so if, there's, if you have available masks or if you have 
um, you know, gloves and those kinds of things. That, or if you want to make, I love when people have like uniquely handmade masks and there's sort of creative patterns. And uh, mm -hmm. I've seen these ones that have like, it's a photo of someone's face and those are kind of freaky, but kind of enjoyable at the same time. Um, I think th things like that um, uh, are, are always going to be valuable, are always going to be a need for, for that. Um, especially now as you know, months go on and some of my older masks are getting a little torn and, and worn, and it's time to refresh and new. And John, how can, how can folks help you right now? Well, I mentioned the meal volunteer program that we're still mm -hmm. relying heavily on. And I do think this is a time where, while some of us are overwhelmed in how much work there is, others are kind of sh sheltering in place and maybe they're on pause mm -hmm. with their um, their job or whatever. And so getting involved in um, very unique ways through our shelters, there are lots of ways to, to make a real difference right now. And one way um, through efforts that United Way is doing is to sign up to be a housing advocate. So as these housing projects come online, um, the motels you mentioned and others, they're going to go through public approval processes and to be, be trained and ready to go as an advocate for those projects. Um, housing is the absolute solution. Our shelters don't work without flow to housing. We can't solve the problem of homelessness without more housing. So that's a great way to get involved is just take the time to be educated and ready to speak when your community has the opportunity to add housing. Yeah, that's a great. I'm glad you highlighted that one. That is is so important. And I, I think that we've, Sue, I think United Way, you've got quite, quite a, an awesome team of folks who have, have put their hands up and said, yes, I want to do that. I want to go through the training and I want to be part of that. Um, is, Sue, any other, you know, any other things, what can, can folks at home do to support your work or to, to get involved? Well, I would um, ask people just go to unitedwayoc.org and they can learn about the Pandemic Relief Fund. Um, if they um, can support that, that's fantastic. But there's also all the volunteer activities. And as Don said, and thank you, Don, for mentioning that, um, they can attend a virtual homelessness 101 class. And from there, if they want to become a housing champion, there are other virtual uh, classes on how do you um, help, you know, um, bring a, a coherent argument of why this is the right thing and be a strong advocate in your community to do the right thing for our homeless neighbors. So um, there's a lot of information on our site, but I'd say learn about the fund, support it if you can, if not volunteer and get educated and that's through all of those programs. So um, we just appreciate everyone in any way they can, time, talent, treasure, whatever you can do, we'll, uh, we'll, uh, could use your help. Yeah. And there are so there are so many, yeah, so many ways to get involved, so many ways to get engaged. Uh, so I just want to say a huge thank you to all of you for joining us today. And more importantly, I just want to say a huge thank you for your leadership uh, in in addressing our homelessness crisis here in Orange County. And I think in your uh, you know profound belief and your determination um, that, that we can and we must and that we will and homelessness in Orange County. Um, and everyone at home, thank you for joining us. Be well, uh, stay safe, and stay strong.